Slavery in Portugal occurred since before the country's formation. During the pre-independence period, inhabitants of the current Portuguese territory were often enslaved and enslaved others. After independence, during the existence of the Kingdom of Portugal, the country played a leading role in the Atlantic slave trade, which involved the mass trade and transportation of slaves from Africa and other parts of the world to the American continent. Slavery was abolished in Portugal in 1761 by the Marcus de Pombal. After the abolishment of slavery in Portugal, the Portuguese slave traders turned to clients in other countries where slavery was not yet abolished such as the United States of America. History Ancient era Slavery was a major economic and social institution in Europe during the Classical era and a great deal is known about the ancient Greeks and Romans in relation to the topic. Rome added Portugal to its empire 2nd century BC, the latter a province of Lusitania at the time, and the name of the future kingdom was derived from Portucale, a Roman and post-Roman settlement situated at the mouth of the Douro River. The details of slavery in Roman Portugal are not well known, however, there were several forms of slavery, including enslaved minors and domestic servants. Visigothic and Subi kingdoms The Visigoths and the Subi Germanic tribes, of the 5th century AD, seized control of the Iberian Peninsula as the Roman Empire fell. At the time, Portugal did not exist as a separate kingdom, but was primarily a part of the Visigothic Iberian Kingdom the Visigothic ruling class lived apart and heavily taxed the native population. However, during this period, a gradual transition to feudalism and serfdom was occurring throughout Europe. Islamic Iberia After the Umayyad conquest of Hispania in the 8th century, in which Moors from North Africa crossed the Strait of Gibraltar and defeated the Visigothic rulers of Iberia, the territory of both modern-day Portugal and Spain fell under Islamic control. The pattern of slavery and serfdom in the Iberian Peninsula differs from the rest of Western Europe due to the Islamic conquest. They established Moorish kingdoms in Iberia, including the area that is occupied by modern Portugal. In comparison to the north, classical style slavery continued for a longer period of time in southern Europe and trade between Christian Europe, across the Mediterranean, with Islamic North Africa meant that Slavic and Christian Iberian slaves appeared in Italy, Spain, southern France, and Portugal. In the 8th century, the Islamic conquest in Portugal and Spain changed this pattern. Trade ties between the Moorish kingdoms and the North African Moorish state led to a greater flow of trade within those geographical areas. In addition, the Moors engaged sections of Spaniards and Portuguese Christians in slave labor. There was not a racial component to slavery in Iberia. The Moors utilized ethnic European slaves, one-twelfth of Iberian population were slave Europeans, less than 1% of Iberia were Moors and more than 99% were native Iberians. Periodic Arab and Moorish raiding expeditions were sent from Islamic Iberia to ravage the remaining Christian Iberian kingdoms, bringing back stolen goods and slaves. In a raid against Lisbon in 1189, for example, the Almohad Caliph Yaqub al-Mansur held 3,000 women and children as captives, while his governor of Córdoba, in a subsequent attack upon Silves, held 3,000 Christian slaves in 1191. In addition, the Christian Iberians who lived within Arab and Moorish ruled territories were subject to specific laws and taxes for state protection. Reconquista Muslim Moors who converted to Christianity, known as Moriscos, were enslaved by the Portuguese during the Reconquista. 9.3% of slaves in southern Portugal were Moors, and many Moors were enslaved in 16th century Portugal. It has been documented that other slaves were treated better than Moriscos, the slaves were less than 1% of population. After the Reconquista period, Moorish slaves began to outnumber Slavic slaves in both importance and numbers in Portugal. Age of discovery <inaudible> 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 
Black slaves African slaves prior to 1441 were predominantly Berbers and Arabs from the North African Barbary coast, known as Moors to the Iberian. They were typically enslaved during wars and conquests between Christian and Islamic kingdoms. The first expeditions of Sub-Saharan Africa were sent out by Prince Infante de Henrique, known commonly today as Henry the Navigator, with the intent to probe how far the kingdoms of the Moors and their power reached. The expeditions sent by Henry came back with African slaves as a way to compensate for the expenses of their voyages. The enslavement of Africans was seen as a military campaign because the people that the Portuguese encountered were identified as Moorish and thus associated with Islam. The royal chronicler Gomes Eanes de Zarara was never decided on the Moorishness of the slaves brought back from Africa, due to a seeming lack of contact with Islam. Slavery in Portugal and the number of slaves expanded after the Portuguese began exploration of Sub Saharan Africa. Slave raids in Sub Saharan Africa began in the 1430s and 1440s as war campaigns, but this period was short lived. The Portuguese quickly transitioned into a trade network with African nobility and slavers. Prince Infante de Henrique began selling African slaves in Lagos in 1444. In 1455, Pope Nicholas V gave Portugal the rights to continue the slave trade in West Africa, under the provision that they convert all people who are enslaved. The Portuguese soon expanded their trade along the whole west coast of Africa. Infante de Henrique held the monopoly on all expeditions to Africa granted by the Crown until his death in 1460. Afterward, any ship sailing for Africa required authorization from the Crown. All slaves and goods brought back to Portugal were subject to duties and tariffs. Slaves were baptized before shipment. Their process of enslavement, which was viewed by critics as cruel, was justified by the conversion of the enslaved to Christianity. The high demand for slaves was due to a shortage of laborers in Portugal. Black slaves were in higher demand than Moorish slaves because they were much easier to convert to Christianity and less likely to escape. Although it was more expensive to purchase a slave than it was to employ a freeman, the sparse population and the lack of free labor made the purchase of a slave a favorable capital investment. The number of black slaves in Portugal given by contemporary accounts argue that Lisbon and the colonies of Portugal averaged a maximum of 10% of the population between the 16th and 18th centuries, but these numbers are impossible to verify. Most slaves in Portugal were concentrated in Lisbon and to the south in the Algarve. The number of black slaves brought to Lisbon and sold cannot be known. This is because the records of both royal institutions responsible for the sale of black slaves, the Casa de Guiné and the Casa dos Escravos were damaged during the earthquake of 1755 in Lisbon, and the fiscal records containing the numbers and sales of these companies were destroyed. The records of the royal chronicler Zarara claim that 927 African slaves were brought to Portugal between 1441 and 1448, and an estimated 1,000 black slaves arrived in Portugal each year afterward. A common estimate is that around 2,000 black slaves arrive in Lisbon annually after 1490. Because of Portugal's small population, Portuguese colonization was only possible with the large number of slaves they had acquired. In the late 15th and into the 16th centuries, the Portuguese economic reliance on slaves was less in question than the sheer number of slaves found in Portugal. People wishing to purchase slaves in Portugal had two sources, the Royal Slaving Company, the Casa da Guiné, or from slave merchants who had purchased their slaves through the Casa de Guiné to sell as retail. There were up to 70 slave merchants in Lisbon in the 1550s. Slave auctions occurred in the town or market square, or in the streets of central Lisbon. The sale of slaves was compared by observers as similar to the sale of horses or livestock. The laws of commerce regarding slavery addresses them as merchandise or objects. There was a period of time set upon purchase for the buyer to decide if he is happy with the slave he had purchased. The occupations of slaves varied widely. Some slaves in Lisbon could find themselves working in domestic settings, but most worked hard labor in the mines and metal forges, while others worked at the docks loading and maintaining ships. Some slaves worked peddling cheap goods at the markets and returning the profits to their masters. Opportunities for slaves to become free were scarce, however there were many instances in which slaves had either elevated their status or obtained their freedom. Slaves were able to buy their freedom by saving any earnings, so long as their masters allowed them to keep their earnings, or purchase a slave to replace them. 
Women slaves could be freed if their masters chose to marry them, but this was more common among the colonies. When Lisbon was on the verge of being invaded in 1580, slaves were promised their freedom in exchange for their military service. 440 slaves took the offer and most, after being freed, left Portugal. Black female slaves were desired for sexual purposes, resulting in many mixed-race offspring. This prompted the Council of Trent in 1563 to denounce the widespread immorality. Mulattoes had the ability to integrate into society, some would even command whole fleets of ships. Slavery did little to alter society in Portugal, due to the slight ease of enslaved people's integration, those who did not assimilate were treated similar to the poor. Asians After the Portuguese first made contact with Japan in 1543, a large-scale slave trade developed in which Portuguese purchased Japanese as slaves in Japan and sold them to various locations overseas, including Portugal itself, throughout the 16th and 17th centuries. Many documents mention the large slave trade along with protests against the enslavement of Japanese. Japanese slaves are believed to be the first of their nation to end up in Europe, and the Portuguese purchased large numbers of Japanese slave girls to bring to Portugal for sexual purposes, as noted by the Church in 1555. King Sebastian feared that it was having a negative effect on Catholic proselytization since the slave trade in Japanese was growing to massive proportions, so he commanded that it be banned in 1571. Records of three Japanese slaves dating from the 16th century, named Gaspar Fernandez, Miguel and Ventura who ended up in Mexico showed that they were purchased by Portuguese slave traders in Japan, brought to Manila from where they were shipped to Mexico by their owner Perez. Japanese slave women were even sold as concubines to black African crewmembers, along with their European counterparts serving on Portuguese ships trading in Japan, mentioned by Luis Cerquira, a Portuguese Jesuit, in a 1598 document. Hideyoshi blamed the Portuguese and Jesuits for this slave trade and banned Christian proselytizing as a result. Some Korean slaves were bought by the Portuguese and brought to Portugal from Japan, where they had been among the tens of thousands of Korean prisoners of war transported to Japan during the Japanese invasions of Korea 1592 Historians pointed out that at the same time Hideyoshi expressed his indignation and outrage at the Portuguese trade in Japanese slaves, he himself was engaging in a mass slave trade of Korean prisoners of war in Japan. Chinese were bought in large numbers as slaves by the Portuguese in the 1520s. Japanese Christian daimyos mainly responsible for selling to the Portuguese their fellow Japanese. Japanese women and Japanese men, Javanese, Chinese, and Indians were all sold as slaves in Portugal. Some Chinese slaves in Spain ended up there after being brought to Lisbon in Portugal and sold when they were boys. Tristan de la China was a Chinese who was taken as a slave by the Portuguese, while he was still a boy and in the 1520s was obtained by Cristobal de Haro in Lisbon, and taken to live in Seville and Valladolid. He was paid for his service as a translator on the 1525 Loisa expedition, during which he was still an adolescent. The survivors, including Tristan, were shipwrecked for a decade until 1537 when they were brought back by a Portuguese ship to Lisbon. There are records of Chinese slaves in Lisbon as early as 1540. According to modern historians, the first known visit of a Chinese person to Europe dates to 1540 or soon after, when a Chinese scholar, apparently enslaved by Portuguese raiders somewhere on the southern China coast, was brought to Portugal. Purchased by João de Bajos, he worked with the Portuguese historian on translating Chinese texts into Portuguese. In 16th century southern Portugal there were Chinese slaves but the number of them was described as negligible being outnumbered by East Indian, Morisco, and African slaves. Amerindians, Chinese, Malays, and Indians were slaves in Portugal but in far fewer number than Turks, Berbers, and Arabs. China and Malacca were origins of slaves delivered to Portugal by Portuguese viceroys. A testament from 23 October 1562 recorded a Chinese man named Antonio who was enslaved and owned by a Portuguese woman, Dona Maria de Valena, a wealthy noblewoman in Évora. Antonio was among the three most common male names given to male slaves in Évora. D. Maria owned one of the only two Chinese slaves in Évora and she specifically selected and used him from among the slaves she owned to drive her mules for her because he was Chinese since rigorous and demanding tasks were assigned to Morisco, Chinese, and Indian slaves. <laughs> 
D. Maria's owning a Chinese, three Indians, and three Moriscos among her fifteen slaves reflected on her high social status, since Chinese, Moriscos, and Indians were among the ethnicities of prized slaves and were very expensive compared to blacks, so high-class individuals owned these ethnicities and it was because her former husband Si Mao was involved in the slave trade in the East that she owned slaves of many different ethnicities. When she died, Di Maria freed twelve of her slaves including this Chinese man in her testament, leaving them with sums from 20,000 to 10,000 reis in money. Di Maria de Valena was the daughter of the nobleman and explorer Sancho de Tovar, the capital of Sofala, list of colonial governors of Mozambique, and she was married twice, the first marriage to the explorer Cristóvão de Mendonca, and her second marriage was to Simão da Silveira, capital of Diu Lista de Governadores, Capitais e Castelos de Diu. D. Maria was left a widow by Simao, and she was a major slave owner, possessing the most slaves in Evora, with her testament recording 15 slaves. A legal case was brought before the Spanish Council of the Indies in the 1570s, involving two Chinese men in Seville, one of them a freeman, Esteban Cabrera, and the other a slave, Diego Indio, against Juan de Morales, Diego's owner. Diego called on Esteban to give evidence as a witness on his behalf. Diego recalled that he was taken as a slave by Francisco de Castañeda from Mexico, to Nicaragua, then to Lima in Peru, then to Panama, and eventually to Spain via Lisbon. While he was still a boy, Chinese boys were kidnapped from Macau and sold as slaves in Lisbon while they were still children. Brazil imported some of Lisbon's Chinese slaves. Filippo Sassetti saw some Chinese and Japanese slaves in Lisbon among the large slave community in 1578, although most of the slaves were blacks. Brazil and Portugal were both recipients of Chinese slaves bought by Portuguese. Portugal exported to Brazil some Chinese slaves. Military, religious, and civil service secretarial work and other lenient and light jobs were given to Chinese slaves while hard labor was given to Africans. Only African slaves in 1578 Lisbon outnumbered the large numbers of Japanese and Chinese slaves in the same city. Some of the Chinese slaves were sold in Brazil, a Portuguese colony. Cooking was the main profession of Chinese slaves around 1580 in Lisbon according to Filippo Sassetti from Florence and they were viewed as hard-working, intelligent, and loyal by the Portuguese, the Portuguese highly regarded Asian slaves like Chinese and Japanese, much more than slaves from sub-Saharan Africa and Moorish Muslims. The Portuguese attributed qualities like intelligence and industriousness to Chinese and Japanese slaves which is why they favored them more. Traits such as high intelligence were ascribed to Indians, Chinese, and Japanese slaves. In 1595, a law was passed by Portugal banning the selling and buying of Chinese and Japanese slaves due to hostility from the Chinese and Japanese regarding the trafficking in Japanese and Chinese slaves. On 19 February 1624, the King of Portugal forbade the enslavement of Chinese people of either sex. A Portuguese woman, Dona Ana de Atade, owned an Indian man named Antonio as a slave in Evora. He served as a cook for her. Anna de Atade's Indian slave escaped from her in 1587. A large number of slaves were forcibly brought there since the commercial, artisanal, and service sectors all flourished in a regional capital like Evora. A fugitive Indian slave from Evora named Antonio went to Badajoz after leaving his master in 1545. Portuguese domination was accepted by the Dossal JAU slaves. In Evora, Brights Figuera owned a Java JAU slave named Maria JAU. Antao Azito took an Indian slave named Hyder to Evora, who along with another slave was from Bengal were among the 34 Indian slaves in total who were owned by Tristeo Hamam, a nobleman in 1544 in Evora. Manuel Gomes previously owned a slave who escaped in 1558 at age 18 and he was said to be from the land of Prester John of the Indias. Named Diogo, in Evora, men were owned and used as slaves by female establishments like convents for nuns. Three male slaves and three female slaves were given to the nuns of Montemor by the Alcade Moor's widow. In order to serve those who serve God, and being told to obey orders, in all things that they ordered them, a boy named Manuel along with his slave mother were given to the nuns of Montemor by Father Jorge Fernandez in 1544. A Capilao do Rey, Father João Pinto left an Indian man in Porto where he was picked up in 1546 by the Evora-based Santa Marta convents nuns to serve as their slave. However, female slaves did not serve in male establishments, unlike vice versa. <laughs> 
Topic: <laughs> Slavery in Macau and the Coast of China. Beginning in the 16th century, the Portuguese tried to establish trading ports and settlements along the coast of China. Early attempts at establishing such bases, such as those in Ningbo and Chenzhou, were however destroyed by the Chinese, following violent raids by the settlers to neighboring ports, which included pillaging and plunder and sometimes enslavement. The resulting complaints made it to the province's governor who commanded the settlement destroyed and the inhabitants wiped out. In 1545, a force of 60,000 Chinese troops descended on the community, and 800 of the 1,200 Portuguese residents were massacred, with 25 vessels and 42 junks destroyed. Until the mid 17th century, during the early Portuguese Mandate of Macau, some 5,000 slaves lived in the territory, in addition to 2,000 Portuguese and an ever growing number of Chinese, which in 1664 reached 20,000. This number decreased in the following decades to between 1,000 and 2,000. Most of the slaves were of African origin. Rarely did Chinese women marry Portuguese, initially, mostly Gones, Ceylonese, Sinhalese from today's Sri Lanka, Indochinese, Malay from Malacca, and Japanese women were the wives of the Portuguese men in Macau. Slave women of Indian, Indonesian, Malay, and Japanese origin were used as partners by Portuguese men. Japanese girls would be purchased in Japan by Portuguese men. From 1555 onwards Macau received slave women of Timorese origin as well as women of African origin, and from Malacca and India. Macau was permitted by Pombal to receive an influx of Timorese women. Macau received an influx of African slaves, Japanese slaves as well as Christian Korean slaves who were bought by the Portuguese from the Japanese after they were taken prisoner during the Japanese invasions of Korea 1592 in the era of Hideyoshi. On June 24, 1622, the Dutch attacked Macau in the Battle of Macau, expecting to turn the area into a Dutch possession, with an 800-strong invasion force led by under Captain Cornelis Reyerzoon. The relatively small number of defenders repulsed the Dutch attack, which was not repeated. The majority of the defenders were African slaves, with only a few dozen Portuguese soldiers and priests in support, and they accounted for most of the victims in the battle. Following the defeat, the Dutch governor Jan Cohen said of the Macau slaves, that, "...it was they who defeated and drove away our people there." In the 1800s, during the Qing dynasty, the British consul noted that some Portuguese were still buying children between five and eight years of age. In 1814, the Jiaqing Emperor added a clause to the section of the Fundamental Laws of China titled, Wizards, Witches, and All Superstitions, Prohibited. Later modified in 1821 and published in 1826 by the Daoguang Emperor, which sentenced Europeans, namely Portuguese Christians who would not repent their conversion, to be sent to Muslim cities in Xinjiang as slaves to Muslim leaders. Treatment During transport to Portugal, slaves were fastened and chained with manacles, padlocks, and rings around their necks. Portuguese owners could whip, chain, and pour burning hot wax and fat onto the skin of their slaves, and punish their slaves in any way that they wished, as long as the slaves remained alive. The Portuguese also used branding irons to brand their slaves as property. <laughs> Banning Voices condemning the slave trade were raised quite early on during the Atlantic slave trade period. Among them was Gaspar da Cruz (1550–1575), a Dominican friar who dismissed any arguments by the slave traffickers that they had legally purchased already enslaved children. Among the earliest condemnations of slavery in Europe during this period, from an early age during the Atlantic slave trade period, the Crown attempted to stop the trading of non-African slaves. The enslavement and overseas trading of Chinese slaves, who were prized by the Portuguese, was specifically addressed in response to Chinese authorities' requests, who, although not against the enslavement of people in Macau and Chinese territories, which was common practice, at different times attempted to stop the transport of slaves to outside the territory. In 1595, a Portuguese royal decree banned the selling and buying of ethnically Chinese slaves. It was reiterated by the Portuguese king on February 19, 1624, and, in 1744, by the Qianlong Emperor, who forbade the practice to Chinese subjects, reiterating his order in 1750. 
However, these laws were not able to stop the trade completely, a practice which lasted until the 1700s. In the American colonies, Portugal halted the use of Chinese, Japanese, Europeans, and Indians to work as slaves for sugar plantations, which was reserved exclusively for African slaves. The abolition of all forms of slavery occurred in 1761 on mainland Portugal and Portuguese India through a decree by the Marquis of Pombal, followed, in 1777, by Madeira. The transatlantic slave trade was definitely outlawed altogether by Portugal in 1836, at the same time as other European powers, as a result of British pressure. Slavery within the African Portuguese colonies, however, would only be definitely abolished in 1869, following a treaty between United States and Britain for the suppression of the slave trade. In Brazil, which had become independent from Portugal in 1822, slavery was finally abolished in 1888. See also Al-Andalus Arab slave trade Atlantic slave trade Barbary pirates Economic history of Portugal Slavery in ancient Rome Slavery in Angola Slavery in Brazil Slavery in China Slavery in India